Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we're going to be talking to Steve Wilson, who's the Chief Product Officer at Contrast Security. And we're going to be talking to Steve about some of the issues, security related issues uh, that, that exist with open source software. Um, Steve's going to tell us about those issues and then also maybe some of the steps that companies can take to mitigate those issues or, or kind of reduce risk. But before we do that, I want to say hi to Steve. Steve, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks, Har- thanks for having me on. Hey, it's my pleasure. And uh, whereabouts are you located? Um, I'm currently at Contrast's office in Los Altos, California. And how are things down in Los Altos? Uh, it looks beautiful out this morning. Blue sky, it's going to be warm one. Did you guys get hit by that summer heat wave that everybody else seems to have been hit by? You know, the nice thing about Northern California is the weather just doesn't change much. So, you know, uh, not as bad as a lot of others. Hey, well, if you want a have a like a guest resident podcaster, um, and you can clear a desk for me, let me know because the, <laughs> <laughs> right now the weather here is actually perfect. But we had the heat wave, and then the rest of the year has been just wet and miserable. But uh, okay, I'll I'll stop my complaints. So, um, so hey, Steve, you know, I, I looked in the show notes here, and you know. It, I was kind of surprised that you made a strong case, or at least the notes do, that there are some pretty serious security-related issues with open source. Um, can you kind of uh, set the stage, as you would, to explain, like, you know, what what percentage of the software that we use is open source, and what should we be concerned about? Sure. So, um, you know, when you think about the the applications on the internet. Um, And that's everything from, you know, Amazon's shopping cart to YouTube to the business applications that sit underneath, you know, Fortune 500 companies and banks. Um, These actually, if you you just measure the code by weight, um, it's it's over 70% of the code in these these applications is actually open source. Um, now we find when we get underneath it, not all of that is used, and we'll we'll get into why that's important. But I'd say roughly a third of the code that's out there executing is written by people on open source projects who you don't know, and maybe two thirds is written by the people you think are providing the application. That's um, to me actually, you know, and I've I've been in the business a while, uh, a, a bit surprising because I mean I think about all the different, you know, large uh, off-the-shelf enterprise apps that companies and individuals buy. Um, and then I think, it, but I guess, you know, I, I just, I'm just trying to put my mind on the the, the biggest open source kind of um, platforms that we would use. And you mentioned some of them, not, and I, I kind of thought that they were pr- proprietary platforms. But um, yeah, why don't, why don't you kind of continue with that? Yeah, well, so if you think about um, you know, take the software that your bank is writing for you to do online online banking or, you know, even the, the software at a, at a trading platform. Uh, they're going to write a lot of that software their, themselves. That is their competitive differentiation. But underneath that sits a lot of software with funny, obscure names that does low level functions that are in general not very differentiating. Everybody just needs the same kind of stuff. And and so they all get it from a common place and they will grab it from places with names like the Apache Foundation or the Linux Foundation, where people work together on these things and contribute to them. And in general, it's great from the industry. But if you take an example from late last year, there's a popular open source piece of software called Log4j. And it's Mm -hmm. just simply a way for applications to write out some data as they're executing so they can keep track of what's going on. Um, It's thought of, you know, in general, uh, it's over 20 years old. It was thought of as being very mature, used in literally millions of applications around the world. And then suddenly it was discovered to have a major security flaw. And, you know, within hours of this becoming public, uh, Apple, Tesla, um, tons and tons of uh, websites out there were were compromised through this. Well, 
I mean, that, that can be the issue with any type of software, proprietary, enterprise, uh, you know, open source. One of the issue, one of the say issues, one of the, I guess, arguments for open source is that there's kind of this self-policing community to spot security issues. Um, what makes, for example, the, the, the example that you just gave or open source in general, what makes it any more vulnerable to security issues than, than other types of software? So here's the interesting thing. I would say that in general, it's not that open source is necessarily more vulnerable to security issues, although there are some factors to consider, right? Um, you know, depending on the open source project, um, how much expertise do the people contributing have in software security coding? What kind of tools is the open source project using to guarantee that their code is secure? But beyond that, the, the big risk with the open source is so many of these things are popular. Um, they're well developed, but they're old. And that's what you see with these, these projects that have been hit with these big vulnerabilities. Um, you know, the big well-known ones are things like Log4j, more recently Spring, um, most famously a few years ago, Equifax, uh, the big credit rating agency was using a piece of software called Strut and they were hacked and they lost the credit um, information of almost everybody in the United States. They were fined half a billion dollars for that. Um, but that these are pervasive. And so if somebody can find a vulnerability in one of them, then there are thousands or even millions of applications that could be exploited through that vulnerability. And what's happened over the last you know, few years is the hacking community has realized that. Um, mm -hmm. So you can say, well, the advantage of open source is everyone can see the source code, they can make it more secure, but so can the hackers. And so you've got nation state level entities inspecting the source code of popular open source projects, looking for chinks in the armor where they can exploit things at massive scale. So just to kind of continue with that thread, when you say, you know, a lot of this cold, uh, code is old, is the issue with old code inherently that um, the the abilities of hackers has evolved since the development of that code to allow for um, the exploitation of vulnerabilities or to better spot vulnerabilities? I mean, what what is it intrinsically with older code that makes it dangerous or, you know, uh, riskier? Yeah, so it's certainly not a binary switch, but when you think about um, these popular libraries like a log4j, um, you know, I was, I was actually working on the Java project at Sun in the late 90s and early 2000s, and I, I wrote a lot of code as part of the JDK. Um, I was, by modern standards, incredibly naive about code security and what that means and what were the best practices and how would you ensure your code was secure. And so certainly these things have matured, but um, but at the same time, that, that code gets um, to be solid, it gets to be well-tested, it gets to be well-trusted, people worry about compatibility. And that was one of the key issues with Log4j, where there were some features that probably shouldn't have even been there at all, but had been there for a while, people left them in for compatibility. Um, and that's where the vulnerabilities strike. So, um, it's not just that the code is old, but certainly what that means is it, um, it's layered, it's complex. The people working on the project today might not be the people who wrote large blocks of the code in the first place. And your point about the evolution of, of hackers and the tools that they use and the expertise that they have, that's accelerating dramatically. Um, the resources that the hackers have access to, whether it be you know, funding from different sources, whether it be access to massive amounts of computing resource, uh, new advanced uh, tools to try and uh, probe and exploit uh, possible vulnerabilities. The threat landscape is dramatically different than it was even five years ago. So if you were, let's look at two different roles. Um, one is you're the CISO of a large organization that is running some of these or has open source code intermingled with a variety of platforms that their company is using. Um, and then second, we'll look at like if you're head of product or head of head of DevOps or secure DevOps. But let's go back, keep with the CISO role in the beginning. 
you're a CISO and you've got you all you're using these different tools, you know that a significant amount is um, you know older open source code. What do you do? Yeah, so you know the the CISO in general has understood for a while that they need to really be involved in the security of the applications that their companies are creating. And, you know, really inside companies, there's in general a, a team called AppSec for short for application security. Uh, they buy a lot of different tools to help um, scan these applications for possible vulnerabilities. Um, but in general, the tools people have been using for, you know, the last 10, 15 years, they're really not suited to modern software development. And so the idea that you can take the source code for your application, run a scanner across it, find all the vulnerabilities. Uh, what companies find is those those scanners turned up so many possible things that you have to go look at that the signal to noise ratio basically means they get completely ignored. Um, you know, a few years ago after that Equifax hack, almost as a direct result of it, people started to wake up to, in particular, the threat around open source. And so now that is tracked much more closely. So when people do find a vulnerability in a piece of open source code, um, it gets a common vulnerabilities and exposure rating. It gets cleared through a central clearinghouse at MITRE. And there's a whole set of tools that have grown up called software composition analysis. And this really looks at your open source libraries. It compares them against that database and finds if your libraries have known vulnerabilities. So for example, Contrast has a free tool called CodeSec. Um, you can run CodeSec against all the libraries in your application, and we can tell you if there are known vulnerabilities. And that was really step one. And you know, in the case of Equifax, they had a vulnerable library that was there that was known to have a vulnerability, but it was there for months because they weren't really tracking what was there. So first thing to do, as a CISO is make sure that you have really tight inventory of your open source software, that it's up to date and you're tracking it against known vulnerabilities with a software composition analysis tool um, and that you're doing that really early. The other problem with those tools is if you don't run them frequently, one of those vulnerabilities will show up, but you won't find it till much later. And, and typically these kind of scans have been things that have been done you know, maybe once a quarter, maybe once a year. In fact, you need to be doing them every day for them to be effective. And so using a tool like CodeSec can be part of that. Um, however, the, the next piece of this is when you look at the, the recent vulnerabilities in things like Log4j and Spring, these were true zero day vulnerabilities. The, um, the industry, the developers, the security teams were not ready for it when it hit and it came out all at once. And that means, you know, just running a scan of your open source libraries, by then it's too late. Um, and in fact, we were able to do some research and see um, for Log4j, for example, it wasn't just after the vulnerability was disclosed that people were exploiting it. We saw um, a rise in hacking attempts two weeks prior um, as, you know, sort of information about this swirled around the hacking community before it was really publicly disclosed. Now, could, could you tell at that point what they were targeting or what kind of vulnerability they were targeting? Or you just you just saw that there was an there was an increased activity. So obviously there's some something is going on, right? There's some kind of it's like when the market reacts to bad news before the bad news is actually known, right? Yeah. Um, what one of the things that's that's um, really interesting about contrast does is we don't just provide those scanning tools. We call we provide tools called runtime protection. And what that means is we help the developers build in some active defenses into their applications. And it turns out a lot of the vulnerabilities in applications, they're not they're not random, they're not all different. They fall into very clearly defined categories. And there's actually there's a organization on the internet called OWASP, which mm -hmm. uh, basically helps categorize and track the top 10 vulnerability types every year. And, you know, in the case of Log4j, that falls broadly into a category 
uh, vulnerabilities called an injection attack, where basically the hacker can take data and sneak it into the application. And in this case, they were able to sneak it into the log files, and then the log files went somewhere people didn't expect, and it got picked up, and it actually enabled the hackers to execute code on the company's servers um, by injecting this. Now, what's, what's interesting with our runtime protection is we didn't have to know that there was a flaw in the log4j library. Um, what the runtime protection tools do is know, for example, what does an injection attack look like and how do we protect against it? And so uh, companies that had embedded the runtime protection into their applications, uh, those weren't exploitable. Even if they had the vulnerable open source library, it wasn't possible to use the exploit that was out there on the internet on how to inject your code into the system. Um, and that allowed us to kind of track the behavior. And so what we could see um, kind of retroactively is we could go back and look and say, um, you know, on, on any given day, we see thousands of attempts to exploit injection attacks on our um, customer servers. Um, but what we could see was kind of a 2x increase in that two weeks prior, we're just mm -hmm. a, a statistically unprecedented spike in those. And, um, you know, as a, as a community, we're gonna get, need to get better at spotting those in advance, but by having defenses built into your application, you could actually know that you were safe. And so we had customers who told us, you know, hey, we actually, we use the runtime protection on what we thought of as our most critical apps. Um, we tested it out. They're not exploitable. So those developers are all going home for the weekend. Everybody who works on a different app, they're gonna be here all weekend looking for um, code with that vulnerability in it, trying to patch it. And in fact, we're six or nine months after that. And we know for a fact, there are still just thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies of those vulnerable libraries still floating around in live applications today. What does the open source community do? I mean, you mentioned uh, OWASP, um, but in addition to that, what does the open source community do once a vulnerability has been, um, you know, is known um, and, and it, you know, and ensure? Because I think if, you, if we go back to the Equifax example, um, it, you know, if my memory serves me uh, correctly, that you're right, that the, the vulnerability was known for several months, I think it was like four or five months, and they there was actually a patch was developed um, and they just simply didn't deploy the patch. That's the story that you know I, I saw reported on. This was at like an ISSA meeting here. Um, you know, what can the community do in general to just say, hey, everybody, um, you know, this is known and and you got to get this done. I mean, yeah, yeah. So um, look, your memory on the the Equifax situation was was spot on. There were fixes for that that were available for a long time, and that's why they were seen as being so negligent um, about the situation. Um, and really that, that concept of software composition analysis grew up around that because companies needed to take control um, and, and basically be able to look at their stuff on a consistent basis and see is there a known vulnerability. So there was a known CVE issued about that struts problem. It was in the database that it was there. The problem was Equifax wasn't looking for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the open source community, part of the trick is, um, again, not being, most of these open source projects aren't owned and controlled by people at one company or, or any entity at all, right? It's volunteers um, from a number of different uh, places. So in the case of the Log4j vulnerability, it was actually found, um, by a hacker who was willing to disclose it to the open source community. They went to Apache and they say, hey, I found this problem. Um, you know, I'll give you 30 days to fix it um, before I will disclose that I have found this. And in general, these open source communities will kind of snap to and start working on it. Um, you know, but on the other hand, you don't know who's in those communities. And so, hackers have ways of hearing what's going on there, of um, starting to exploit those things. So there's a whole process for how you disclose these things. It's orderly, it generally works. But one of the things is that, um, you know, think about it from a, 
just a privacy perspective, a confidentiality perspective. When I grab one of these free libraries, I don't register with the open source community. They don't track that I'm using that and I wouldn't want it. So the ability for the open source community to reach out to you and tell you about the problem is pretty limited. And that's why people taking on source code, you're taking a responsibility to understand what is in there, to have the tooling in place that's gonna help you analyze it, um, to help you track it, and where required, put up active defenses that are gonna help keep you safe if somebody does find an exploit in some of that code that you're grabbing. Yeah, you, you know what I'm hearing here as a kind of a, a, a sub message is you just doesn't matter whether it's data that you want to protect, infrastructure that you want to protect, or code that you want to protect. The first step is to get an inventory. Uh, you got to know what you have, and then you can start to assess, okay, here's what we got, um, you know, and then what are the known vulnerabilities, and then, you know, what is our, our protection kind of uh, protocol going to be going forward? But so that's that's huge. So, um, you know, again, you're you're that CISO, and then I want to jump tracks to the DevOps guy in a second here, but yeah. um, you're you're the CISO. Um, what is the quickest, fastest way to know exactly what you have? And I and I I think you you know you're you're going to talk a little bit about what contrast can do, but maybe you can give that maybe you know a little bit more um, uh, color to that. Yeah. So um, I'd say in general the the current trending and discussion around this topic of what the, what is the best way to get a handle on this it kind of falls into two camps. Um, there's one which is a, a centralized approach to this, and one of them is called really the shift left approach. So the, the centralized approach is you take some of these um, uh, composition analysis tools and you build them into your uh, development pipeline, into your continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. And so um, Contrast has a tool called Contrast SEA, um, the customers build in there, and as they're testing their applications, we watch what libraries are used, what are loaded, how they get used, what parts get used, and we can give you really fine-grained information on are you using a vulnerable library in a vulnerable way. Is it, is it just checking against known vulnerabilities, or is there a way to just analyze and say, hey, you know what, this code um, has some issues with the way it's been written, um, and it, we, it might not be a known vulnerability, but it's not written in a secure manner. Absolutely. And um, this is one of the, the big um, discussion points out there is in general, people have felt like, um, you know, if I'm a company and I'm producing a piece of software, it's my responsibility to run tools against the code that I write to make sure it's secure. Um, but in general, there's been an assumption that um, all you need to do on your, your open source code, you treat it differently, right? You just run a composition analysis tool that tells you if there's a vulnerability, because if just running one of those scanning tools, how do you even deal with that? Um, Contrast has a tool called Assess, which uses a technology that we call intera interactive application security testing. And basically what this does is rather than looking at the source code, um, basically your computer code sitting on a disk statically, is we weave our sensors into the application so we can see it running. And so the thing about interactive testing is it actually doesn't know the difference between the code you wrote and any of the open source code. It's tracking the data flows and for example, looking for one of those injection attacks um, you can kind of see the data flow top to bottom. You can see data going from somewhere uh, that it shouldn't to somewhere that it shouldn't be. Um, and in fact, you know, with the log4j injection attack, Assess was able to show our customers actually for years previously that um, some of their applications could be vulnerable to log injection attack. And so at that point, people were able to put that into their backlogs of security issues that they should address. Um, and, you know, then the companion piece to that, um, and we'll we'll get to that in DevOps, is actually leaving some of that in, that intelligence in while you're executing in real time. But, but the other piece of this is really what we call the shift left piece. And it's the idea that it isn't just a centralized security team 
that wants to be scanning these things. Um, you want developers to be involved in this. Do it early, do it often, do defense in depth. And so uh, free tools like CodeSec allow the developers to basically drop this on their laptop, run a command at a command line, get instant results showing them if any of their libraries have known vulnerabilities in them. Awesome. So, and and basically, I mean, if you're if you're writing code um, or running code, but you you would be writing, and just like you do any kind of testing on it um, to make sure that the, it's it's doing what you what you designed it to do, you would also make sure that it's been written in a secure manner. Yeah, basically, just becomes you do part it of the at process. the same time you run your unit tests for correctness. Um, you kind of brace that with a set of security assessments at the same time. Awesome. And that leads right into the secure DevOps, DevOps um, discussion. Tell me then, I mean, you've kind of already answered the question, but are there any other kind of best practices or recommendations that, that you would have for people who are running a dev team um, just to make sure that they don't come up against these issues later? Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple of pieces to think about here. Um, one is uh, when, you, when you think about the actual deployment of the application, um, a lot of the tools out there, they're going to track the application as kind of the unit of measure. So they're going to know, um, hey, uh, the banking portal application has these open source libraries in it. From the DevOps side, you, you actually you have another question, which is, OK, that banking application has that open source library in it but but modern applications are complicated um, they're built up of combinations of different servers and server uh, servers and services spread throughout your data center or the cloud and so your your inventory control on these needs to not just include that the banking app includes log4j it's the banking app is running on these servers and the log4j code is held in these places. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, one of the things we found is that a typical large scale application might embed six copies of log4j in different places. And so the for, you know, your, your inventory, which you control uh, for your inventory control, which you pointed out is so important, it gets really, really complicated for the DevOps team. And um, and in the case where you have a zero day and you need to remediate that quickly, that's where you're going for a hunt and you don't want to be. You want to know all of that up front. Um, the other piece, though, is putting up active defenses. And these um, you know, fall into a couple big camps. Uh, one of them is called the web app firewall. You know, back in the old days, I think one of the reasons I could be so naive about security coding is because most of your code ran in a data center, physically controlled behind a firewall and was only accessible from, you know, other employees at the company inside the building. Um, in the world of cloud computing and, um, you know, consumer applications, that, that's not true. You're sitting on the internet, large blocks of code with lots of entry points. And so um, the, the firewall has evolved into what's called a web app firewall, which tries to be more intelligent, tries to look at the traffic coming in and coming out. Um, it can defend you from certain types of attacks like, you know, brute force attacks like denial of service attacks, and it's really important for that. But, you know, it's encrypted traffic. It doesn't understand the internals of the application. So its defenses are pretty limited. It's, it's limited to sort of signatures of common exploits, it's the equivalent of what your old virus protection used to look for on your laptop, which was also brittle. Um, uh, the advantage of building in some runtime protection, like what we call contrast protect, is that it sits inside the application. It can see the flows in detail. It understands the structure of the application. And so really a, a combination of a well-configured web app firewall and a set of runtime defenses built into the application is actually a, a great way to dramatically increase the security posture of your application. And, and how long does it take to set something like this up? If you, if you wanted to deploy um, some of the, the tools that you just talked about, yeah, so um, you know, in the case of contrast protect, uh, it's 
it's really easy. You know, if you want to test this out, it's a case of um, taking the contrast agent, um, attaching a flag to where your Java virtual machine gets started, if it's a Java application, for example, although we support um, 10 of the most popular programming languages for enterprises. And basically, it just weaves itself in as your program loads. And so you can be up and testing this out in 15 minutes. And you know, rolling this out into production, people will usually want to test it and shake it down and all these other things. But we, um, you know, help manage tens of thousands of application instances for our customers, so it's it's pretty well vetted. So it's it's not the kind of thing that is really complicated. It's just the kind of thing that most people aren't even aware of is an option for them yet. Okay, and so do do you run it on a kind of managed service basis, or your customers they take the ball and run with it? Um, so what we do is we actually have a couple different options. Um, some of our customers uh, like to control the thing end to end. And so they take um, they take our agent, which is what goes into the application, and they take what we call our team server, which collects all the information and does things like generate alerts and things. And they'll run that themselves. And, um, you know, we have military customers who run air-gapped networks and things, and they will do it that way. Um, the other way that we do it is um, the code will go into your application, whether that's running in your data center or the cloud. Um, but we'll manage uh, kind of all of the collection of vulnerabilities. We score them for you, um, uh, vulnerabilities, attacks, exploits, and you just log into our web portal and get all that information. And I'm curious because, you know, in the second case, you're collecting and have visibility on some pretty sensitive information. Um, do in the um, the original case where you mentioned they, the customers want to control from end to end, do they um, do you still have visibility in terms of vulnerabilities that the um, that your tool has spotted? No, they can actually if they want to go totally air gapped, then um, they they update the intelligence in their system by downloading mm -hmm. things from us periodically so it stays up to date but they control their information end to end um in the case where somebody's using our our cloud-based service actually a lot of the information still stays inside their application um but there is a set of metadata that we stream up to the cloud so that we can kind of aggregate that, score it for them, and um, and display the results for them and, and their teams in an easy to process way. Awesome. What are the, um, the biggest concerns or questions that your customers ask you um, about your, your, your tools prior to um, deploying them? Yeah. Um, look, I'd say that you know, the first question that people are struggling with with uh, security testing tools is the credibility of the tool. Is what it tells me real? And I think that's what people have come to expect from the current crop of application security tools out there is that they are brutally inaccurate. And, um, and I lived this myself in my previous job before I joined Contrast. I was working at a big independent software vendor, not a security company, but a company building cloud computing software. And the head of engineering came to me one day and said, Steve, I need to cancel the roadmap this quarter. And when I asked him why, because that didn't sound like a good idea to me as a business no. <laughs> owner trying to uh, get out new features and compete in the market, and he said, well, Security team just ran some crazy scan on on our source code and filed a thousand bug tickets against it for security problems. Now, as a that's as your an new roadmap. <laughs> this, I'm pretty worried that I have a thousand security vulnerabilities in my software. Um, but what we found after we you know took every engineer on the project and diverted them and dug into it was almost none of that was real. Um, it was almost all what we term false positives. And, and that is the, the dearth of application testing tools. And so the first thing people want to test out with this is, um, hey, I know you've got benchmarks that show this is really accurate. That's great. I want to try it on my own system. I want to try it on some of these applications. I want to compare the results with the tools I have today. And often the first thing they're shocked about was they're like, hey, you're finding 
five percent as much stuff as my old tools are you not doing your job and it's like no what we are doing is our job and finding the stuff that's actually important and filtering out all the noise so that's the first thing well can you just drill down on that for a second so you know how would you define something that's noise versus real and how do you do that so um there's a couple pieces to this but it really comes from the idea of um most of the application security testing tools out there work on source code. And so it's basically just imagine staring at pages and pages and pages of source code and then trying to figure out what it does. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a, it's a, you know, to use a technical term, it's a computer science hard problem, meaning Mm -hmm. it's not something you can solve with, with regular algorithms. And so there's a lot of, guessing a lot of like, hey, this pattern is not a good idea. You might want to look at this versus this is a vulnerability in your code. Um, The way contrast works when it gets inside your application is we're watching all the data flows. We're literally tagging every string. Um, You know, so every block of characters coming into the application, we're watching that. And so while you're testing your application, we can look at say what somebody's entering into a text field on a web page or what they're sending to a uh, API, a programming interface to try and interface with your system. And, um, and we can watch where those go, where they flow. And so for example, if I find one of these strings going all the way from a web page down to your database, without going through some kind of system that's that's investigating it or cleaning it up, you could send a database command instead of your username um, uh, into my system. And that database mm-hmm. command could say, get me all the social security numbers. And I know that, you know, if you haven't done this before, that might sound insane, but it's probably the most common vulnerability that we find. And so what we do is we don't say, hey, we kind of suspect that might be possible. We say with 100% certainty that is possible. Here's the stack trace. Here's where it starts. Here's where it ends. And here's how you fix the problem. That's huge, a huge help. I mean, like you, you, like you said, you're, you're sifting through all the noise. You find what's important and, um, and just say, hey, you got to fix it. Because yep. you're right. I mean, every scan that I've seen, the issue is always just too much information and how do you prioritize and how do you even trust it? How do you even know, you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, because uh, yeah, they, they, that's just like, you, I, I think you, you spotted that issue 100%. Um, well, let me ask you this because uh, we're kind of g- coming up on time here, but in your role as a uh, chief product officer, where do you go and how do you keep abreast of new developments that you both in terms of the, the vulnerability side, but also in terms of developing your product, um, you know, how do you keep abreast of the latest developments that you need to be aware of? Um, that's a great question. So that, you know, honestly, the the first best resource that we have is we have um, hundreds of the world's largest corporations and organizations as our customers um, who are desperately um, all fighting these battles. And so, staying in really close touch with our customers as well as prospects, um, they teach us new things every day. And so, you know, our job is to synthesize what we're hearing across this entire customer base, figure out what the biggest problems are and and help the whole customer base solve them. Um, The other thing, obviously, that, um, you know, we're on the lookout for are uh, these different trends, you know, we have a, uh, what we call our security research team on staff that is kind of looking in all the places that aren't your, your standard news publications. You know, they're, they're trolling the web for signs where somebody's saying, Hey, I found a new hack for this, or this is a new type of vulnerability. And so we really have a whole team full of security experts who are designed to keep us in front of that. And so, you know, my job is as chief product officers to synthesize a lot of this from the theoretical new problems that are churning around on the internet to um, issues that customers are bringing me where they're telling me they're in pain, that their current tools aren't working or that they're not finding things or they're being overwhelmed by things. Um, our job is to continue to evolve this in ways that make it easier 
for customers to ensure that their systems are safe. I think that's that's some great advice there. Um, and I also I recognize the challenge of, of, of being a, a chief product officer or, or responsible for product development because uh, you you probably get tons of requests from your customers, your um, from your you know business development managers to say, hey, we we really need this. How do you prioritize? And so I mean, I, I would assume that you do spend a lot of time talking with your customers to understand what they really need versus what they think they need, and so on and so forth. It's it's a it's a it, look, it's actually, it's part of the job. In some ways, it's the most fun part of the job. But, um, you know, I'd say as a, a chief product officer, the biggest lesson that I've learned in my career um, from a, another startup that I was doing years ago was there's a big difference between what people tell you they want and what they actually need a lot of the time. And the secret is don't ask them if they want what you're building <laughs> Talk to them about their pain and yeah. what's hurting them right now and what their challenges are. And if you can really understand the customer's pain and their challenges, then your job is to come up with great solutions to that. And then you can go back and you can test those with the customers, see if they're fulfilling the need. But that's really the way to get to the bottom of it, because people will talk to you about what's keeping them awake at night. And this is a place where literally our customers don't sleep. Um, because they're uh, worried about things almost 24/7. Well, again, I think that's some some awesome advice there, um, and just just understand what your customer needs versus what they think they need or tell you that they need. And if you lead with, "Hey, would this be a cool feature?" Yeah, they're probably answer in the um, affirmative, but that's not necessarily solving their problems. So, awesome advice. And uh, and I'm sure when you uh, when you do are are able to solve their problems, it's it's hugely satisfying for you and your entire team. So that's pretty cool. Well, hey Steve, I've um, I've I just I'm looking down at my notes here. I literally have a page and a half full of notes, um, and I'm sure we could keep talking about a lot more stuff. But I've enjoyed this conversation, I've learned a lot, and uh, I'd like to wish you and the rest of the uh, Contrast Security team a great second half of 2022. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, really enjoyed being on. And, uh, you know, if you want to go over any of those notes, would love to come back. And, you know, just for the listeners out there, if you want to get any of this stuff today and play with it, um, developer.contrastsecurity.com. There's a whole bunch of free tools there you can download and get started right now. Awesome. I'll put a link to that in the, uh, as t- or a link to your site in the show notes. Awesome. Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance.